Hello U.S. history students and welcome back. In this video we're looking at the second part of the European theater of war during World War II. We saw in our last video that in Italy and in Russia we are sustaining huge losses fighting this war and, and we know that the prediction is as we're trying to invade into Hitler's Atlantic Wall along the English Channel that this is going to be a very difficult thing to try and accomplish because Hitler had been building up forces to make it nearly impossible possible for the Allied invasion to take place. The invasion of France is popularly known as D-Day because it uh, represents the designated day. Now there are many designated days throughout um, the history of World War II, but this invasion day or designated day was also called Operation Overlord. And this is going to take place in June of 1944. So the United States has been preparing for this one for many years, and Operation Overlord is being led by a skilled commander and strategist just by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower, who of course is a future president. And Dwight Eisenhower was looking at the cross-channel assault that was going to take place against Hitler's Atlantic Wall, and he had much fear and trepidation about it. Because the planners that were looking at this situation predicted perhaps as many as one million casualties for the Allies as they were preparing to do what's called an amphibious invasion, where they start in England, take to the sea and to the air, and then invade up on land in order to take out the Germans. There was this great operation called Operation Fortitude to try and throw off the Germans uh, as to the exact location of where this attack would take place. There are also a number of other very secretive, covert kinds of ways to try and throw off the Germans leading up to D-Day Normandy. For instance, they took the bodies of several Allied soldiers that had died throughout the war uh, and, and stuffed their pockets with these secret coded messages that they knew that the Germans would be able to break. They weren't really secret coded messages, but they made it look that way. They tucked them into the pockets and then threw these bodies overboard in the English Channel so that they would float up on shore in France. They also did this over uh, on the coast of Gibraltar um, in southern Europe and then also off the coast of of southern France as well, hoping to convince the Germans that every time one of these bodies floats up on shore, it says a different location of where the attack is going to play, take place. All of them causing the Germans to spread their lines even thinner and to not know where this attack will take place. Now, on the actual date of the invasion, the uh, Americans are going to come up with a number of other cool techniques to throw off the Germans. They had a bunch of dummy paratroopers, for instance, that were rigged up with these bombs on their chests, and so they tossed these dummies, it's basically a scarecrow, toss these things out of planes and drop them in the wrong locations away from the actual attack zone so that when they hit the ground, the bombs blow up and that convinces the Germans that, oh, they're being attacked there. Another thing that they did is they sent a bunch of radio signals all over to other parts of Europe, making the Germans think the attack would happen at Calais. They also had a fleet of submarines with air balloons connected to them that were covered in metal so that they would bounce off radar signals in, in Europe where Hitler was trying to defend and make him think that a giant armada was coming his way to Calais instead. Again, all of these really cool secret methods to do anything they could to make it easier for the Allies to get in on Normandy which is the beachhead that they will take instead. This is a very dangerous mission though, and with all of the things, all of the plans that are going into place, still Eisenhower was receiving uh, the news from his commanders that by the time we get into June of 1944, it's still only a 50-50 chance of success, and they're predicting at least 100,000 deaths and maybe as many as a, a million casualties of killed, wounded, and missing in action. The reason that Dwight Eisenhower is getting such a dire prediction is that Hitler's Atlantic Wall seems impregnable. There are huge concrete blockhouses to protect artillery, which were known as Stutzpunken. They had 1,670 miles of fortified gun emplacements all around Europe, going all the way from Denmark over to Spain. There were radar and observation towers, bunkers stretched all the way from the Spanish frontier north to Denmark, trenches and camouflage to protect machine gun nests, beaches lined with four million mines, barbed wire, and anti-tank obstacles. Meanwhile, there were 1.5 million American, British, and Canadian forces preparing in England 
for an invasion that had 4,000 ships and was the largest amphibious invasion in human history. So the attack that's going to take place will happen in three different phases. So the Allies, again, are going to try and convince Hitler that the attack will happen here at Calais. This is going to distract many of his men so that instead the attack can pl take place here along the five different beachheads at Normandy. So the attack is going to happen in three distinct phases. The first phase is going to be an attack done by the 101st Airborne paratroopers who are going to paratroop onto either side of the beachheads at Normandy. Some of them will paratroop into the Cotentin Peninsula on the left and then others to the, uh, to the right of the city of Caen. Their job is quite simply to cause havoc for the Germans, to disrupt their lines of communication, and to secure as many important um, crossing points as possible. Phase two of this attack is going to be the flying fortresses of the B-17s, flying over the enemy beachheads and bombing holes and bombing as many of the Stutzbunken as possible to create areas for our landing forces to go into and have places to hide once the attack takes place. Then the next phase of the attack is the largest amphibious invasion in history. This was supposed to be precipitated by a group of tanks that would make it up on shore. They were basically inflatable tanks and they didn't make it uh, because of the choppiness of the English Channel. Most of those tanks are going to sink to the channel instead of make it up on shore. So this means that on many of these beaches, when these men arrive on their five designated beachheads, they are going to be basically undefended. Now these five points have been designated to be sent by Canadians and two to the Brits and then two to the Americans. The British forces are going to be led by Bernard Montgomery and they will be attacking the beachheads at Gold, Juno, and Sword. And the American attack is going to be led by General Omar Bradley as they attack the beachheads at Utah and Omaha. Now there's this incredible story about how the invasion for D-Day had been delayed several times because of bad weather leading up to that first week of June. The attack will actually take place on June the 6th, 1944, but there's this beautiful story of June the 5th. June the 5th, when they received the orders that now is the time to go, that this is our only open opportunity before the weather turns poor, Dwight D. Eisenhower is, is in a state of panic. You see, he had been for the last week chain smoking pack after pack of cigarettes. He had been drinking on average four to five pots of coffee per day and he was not sleeping, he was nervous and, and he decided he needed to go out and talk to the paratroopers that would be a part of that first wave into Normandy. And so on the evening of June the 5th as these men were getting ready to get into their C-47s, he had in his back pocket a speech that he prepared to give the next day because he'd been planning that this attack could fail. And in the event of a failed attack, Dwight D. Eisenhower had this speech in his back pocket that said, I take full responsibility for the deaths of these men and for the failure of this attack. And he said that he would step down as general. And this, of course, is what he's planning to say if this attack fails tomorrow. So he's thinking these thoughts as he goes and talks to the members of the 101st Airborne. And they can tell he's nervous. They can see his hands shaking as he's trying to give them a pump up speech. And he's clearly not at his best right now. And so he, he is looking at the ground. He can't even make eye contact. Finally, one of the members of the 101st stepped forward and said, sir, don't worry, we got it handled. At that point, Dwight D. Eisenhower enthusiastically is shaking this man's hand. He's overcome with emotion and he's sending these men off to go and fight for freedom and democracy across the Atlantic Wall. As they go off into their C-47s, Eisenhower is going to see these planes taking off and he will give a dramatic salute to the planes as they go as one epic tear rolls down his cheek. It's a beautiful moment in history and in the lead up to D-Day Normandy. So honestly, it's a miracle that this thing worked at all. I mean, it was nearly a failure. And the reason that it was nearly a failure is because the Germans were so well prepared. I mean, just think about how hard it would be for these paratroopers that were part of the first wave of this attack. A paratrooper, in order to get ready for his duty at this time, would have to be able to do a jump, a standing jump from a ledge that is 12 feet off the ground. And what you do is you learn to jump without a chute and tuck and roll so that you don't break your legs or twist your ankle. But when these men are jumping out of an airplane, it's so much more dangerous than anything you could ever imagine. 
the paratroopers, as they are uh, preparing for this thing, would have a, a, basically the equipment to try and be a one-man fighting force or a one-man army when they get into enemy territory. You can see here some of the things that they're wearing. They've got uh, a specialized helmet to help them as they're jumping, and they've got an extra chute, so they've got their main chute and then their reserve chute because often the chutes would not uh, deploy properly. They're usually carrying a top Thompson submachine gun. They had gas masks. They had silk maps as well so that you wouldn't make Make noise and it was also a little more waterproof that way as you're trying to find your way on the maps and they brought with them as well this thing called the Mae West life preserver Mae West was a beautiful actress and model at this time so the idea was if you were falling into the ocean just hold on to Mae West for dear life beautiful so these men as they are paratrooping into enemy territory they they nearly missed all of their landings and um, it, incredibly dangerous circumstances to get into the country as well many of them had to fly in what were called glider planes so a glider plane works where you've got a plane in front and then it tugs another glider plane up into the air and then releases that cable over enemy territory so that these planes can silently glide down into enemy territory that was the first wave of paratroopers now in order to try and prevent this Hitler and his Nazi forces used uh, a bunch of palisades that were sticking up out of the ground to try and stop glider planes from coming in. So many of the men, as they flew into the ground, would be impaled in their, their planes themselves. Also, many of these planes, uh, these glider planes, would have uh, tanks or jeeps or other things that were loaded in the back of the plane. And then the men would be in the front. But as these planes hit the ground, they would hit with such force that often those tanks or jeeps would go flying forward and crush the men inside. And then the men that are jumping out of the C-47s above enemy territory, many of them, as they are getting shot to pieces by, these, by this German anti-aircraft weaponry, so these pilots, in order to avoid getting shot, would fly their planes higher and faster than they were supposed to, uh, that and made it incredibly unsafe for the men. So the paratroopers, as they jumped out of the planes, would often break their necks just from the whiplash of the speed of the plane because the pilots were going too quickly. Another thing is that often, they were, because they were going so fast, sometimes men would crash into the tail of the plane or these men would get hit by other planes behind them and get consumed by the propellers and killed that way. Now those that did make it to the ground, often they couldn't see what they were landing in. Some landed in the ocean and many of them drowned. So to me, it's just incredible to think of what these men did. And once they get to the ground, they are, they're alone. They are alone and they have to fight their way to find their men in enemy territory. What bravery, what incredible men these guys were. And the Germans knew that these guys were coming and uh, they were actually really scared. The rumor had gone along in the German ranks that the Americans had emptied their prisons and gotten all of the rapists and murderers out to become paratroopers for the American attack. Many of these uh, American paratroopers were like, yeah, I like that, I like that rumor, let's keep that going. And in order to make themselves look even cooler, they shaved mohawks into their hair uh, in order to look even more BA as warriors. Some beachheads, the attack went absolutely well. Um, you can see at the attacks at Sword and Gold, which was led by the Brits, and then also at Utah, these beachheads were taken uh, according to plan. In fact, Utah didn't quite go according to plan because they were actually behind the enemy lines on accident. They went the wrong way and went around the Germans on the Cotentin Peninsula, so that enabled them to scale the rocks behind the Germans and have a much easier attack. A great story from that is when Teddy Roosevelt Jr., he wanted to be a part of this thing so badly. He was an officer, so he really didn't need to be storming the beach like that, but he wanted to live up to his family name, so he chose to storm the beachhead armed with nothing but a cane. Churchill himself was begging for the opportunity to invade, but he was forced by uh, the government, and in fact, FDR had to talk him down and say, you know, Churchill, you're not allowed to attack. I'm not allowed to attack. You need to just stay on the ship. That would be bad if you were killed. But Winston Churchill's younger brother, Jack Churchill, nicknamed Mad Jack, is going to take the beachhead armed with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Mad Jack is famously known for his motto, any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. Oh, what beauty and bravery, right? Now, some beachheads, though, were not taken so easily. For instance, the beachhead at Juneau was taken by the Canadians, and one out of every 18 men were killed. And as we look at the American experience at Omaha, I think you can understand why this is the one of the worst days in American history. 
Let's take a look at a clip from the movie Saving Private Ryan. You know, that is just an incredible piece of cinema history right there from Saving Private Ryan. It's it's based on a true story, and it's also just giving us a very real-life kind of perspective into what these men, these heroes, had to fight against at Omaha. As you saw in the film, there's a good reason why Omaha is considered the worst of the beachheads that we attacked on D-Day of 1944. The reason is because the bombardment of the beaches was ineffective. The B-17s that flew over North Normandy and the American Navy that tried to pummel the beach missed many of the key points and fired upon targets that were behind the German lines. And the reason that happened was because of the cloud cover and it was very difficult to see our targets at night. Now the Stutzpunken held strong. These things were camouflaged, they were, they were made of concrete, they were built by slave labor too. Uh, as you've read about in Beneath the Scarlet Sky, the reason that Hitler was able to create this Atlantic Wall was through the use of slave labor of people that he'd stolen from all over Europe to make them build this empire for him. And these Stutzpunken um, were very e effective at trying to prevent the Americans from getting up on shore because they had what's called an interlocking field of fire between the machine guns and their artillery. Basically what that means is that there's really no safe spot on the beach because you're always potentially going to be targeted by something or someone. And uh, the Americans as they were were coming up on shore were actually lucky that the Germans had put some of these uh, defensive fortifications in place. Like the, what you see here is an anti-tank emplacement and an anti-landing craft emplacement. So as the Americans were coming off of their PT boats and you saw that it, they have to cross through what's called a, a death zone. And um, in what happens is the door drops down and the machine guns just target them directly. But those murder holes uh, or those death zones made it so that many of the men would jump into the water and they would try to swim to safety. Many of these men, however, um, did not make it to these anti-tank emplacements. Many of these men fell into water that was simply too deep. And part of the reason that they were often in water that was too deep was because the PT boat captains would enter the beach and hit what you'd call a sandbar where it's a little shallower. And they'd hit that and say, okay, well, this is where we get off. But they'd still have like 50 or 100 yards before they make it to the actual beach. And it gets deep in between. Out of the roughly 5,000 men that die at D-Day Normandy, uh, over 1,000 of them are going to end up drowning here at Omaha Beach. And this is going to give us the bloodiest single day in American history since the Battle of Antietam. And you might recall at the Battle of Antietam in the Civil War, there were roughly 26,000 American casualties. And there will be not quite as many here at D-Day Normandy, but it is the one of the saddest days in our history. But the results mean that at this point, we're able to see within a week from this picture here, just how effective this really is becoming. Because now the Americans and the allies have got a, a moment where they can start to launch off of the beaches and then connect with the paratroopers that are all over the Cotentin Peninsula and start to move forward with their attack plans to take out uh, Hitler in throughout Europe. Now you'd think that Hitler, um, when D-Day Normandy was taking place, would have been awake and ready to go and ready to make decisions about what to do next, but he had just been coming off of a four-day long bender in which he had been high on methamphetamines because you see, um, Adolf Hitler was a drug addict and the reason he was a drug addict was because Germany was mass producing amphetamine pills at this time and giving them to their soldiers and giving them to Hitler as well to stay awake and to be energized and even more ex exuberant with their Sieg Heil fives that they were giving each other. And uh, I mean, really, the Nazi war machine was fueled by methamphetamine. And Hitler had just come down from being awake for four days straight. And he fell asleep and was out uh, when D-Day Normandy took place. And so they tried to wake him and he sent them away and said, I don't want to be awoken right now. And finally, when they were able to get him awake five hours after the battle actually began at Normandy, Normandy, uh, he, he gives this interesting response. He said, the news couldn't be better. As long as they were in Britain, we couldn't get at them. Now we have them where we can destroy them. Wow. All right. So many of the generals that are working with Hitler realize this guy has lost his grip. This is not the kind of guy that we want leading our country. And they are planning a way to kill him at this point. So many of his his leaders in the Wehrmacht were prepared to kill him because, I mean, take Erwin Rommel, for instance. Erwin Rommel had a sound military strategy that had worked throughout German history where he said, what we need to do now that the Americans are on the beachhead, we need to withdraw our troops, let them 
get in a little deeper and then we surround them in what's called an enveloping maneuver and we destroy them and kill them. However, Hitler said no, absolutely not. Rather than listening to Erwin Rommel, who had always been one of his most trusted um, generals, the most effective generals, he overruled him and said that they were going to defend every single inch as they're fighting. So this might be a little over our heads right now, but really what it means is that militarily and strategically, it is a very bad move to overrule Rommel on this occasion because he was right. Had he done his move, things would have been different. Thank God they weren't different though, because from this, Rommel is going to develop an even greater distaste for Hitler, but he will probably not be a part of the assassination attempt that's going to take place after D-Day Normandy. Between the time that uh, June the 6th of 1944 and the end of World War II, there were over a hundred different assassination attempts that will take place against Hitler's life. The most famous one is called Operation Valkyrie. Now, we'll get to Operation Valkyrie here in a second, but um, many assassination attempts will take place in an effort to, like for instance, bomb Hitler's train as it's going over some tracks, or um, to bomb his podium as he's giving a speech, for instance. But the thing is that Hitler was never showing up at exactly the time when people thought he would. So often the bombs did not go off at the right time. Uh, there were attempts to poison him. There were all kinds of different attempts to kill this man, but none of them worked. And, and as these attempts failed more and more, it really just emboldened Hitler to be convinced of his own eternal um, lasting nature and his, his divine calling, if you will, to be the dictator of Germany. And Operation Valkyrie is about as close as we could get to actually taking him out. So there's this perpetrator by the name of Klaus von Stauffenberg. So Klaus von Stauffenberg was um, opposed to Hitler, never liked him really at all. He was not a Nazi. He was part of the German Wehrmacht. And in the African campaign, he was wounded significantly and lost his eye. Also developed this distaste for Hitler in, in the way that he wanted to have him removed. And so he got a number of other Wehrmacht generals to support him in this. So the plan was that they would put a bomb right next to Hitler when he was in his wolf's lair. Wolf's lair is his strategic planning area. You can see it right here. It's made of concrete and it has no windows to it. Now that's important because if a bomb blows up in a room that's made of concrete with no windows and really no you know, easy wooden doors to get in and out of, uh, but it's like a, a, a reinforced room, it doesn't have the ability for the percussive effect of the bomb to explode out the windows. So what that would mean is that even if the bomb is not right next to Hitler, when the bomb goes off, the percussive effect could blow his brains out and liquidate his, you know, his innards and then kill all of the other guys that are in there too. So they're hoping to kill the Nazi high command in one big explosion that would kill all these planners as they're planning and strategizing at a meeting. And then Stauffenberg would leave from there and then help take over the government in a coup d'etat, which would establish Rommel as one of the leaders of this uh, of the uh, German nation, and that Rommel would request peace from the Allies on good terms. Think of how differently this would have made things for Germany. I mean, Germany probably never would have been invaded by the USSR had this worked. There's a good chance that the war could have ended there on with far better terms for Germany. There's also a chance that Germany could have risen again, right? So it's probably a good thing it didn't work out here because... After the Holocaust, Germany's got it coming for all of these things that are going to happen to them. But the attack fails. And the reason the attack fails is because it was hot that day. And Hitler decides to move his meeting from the wolf's den and moves it instead into a meeting room that has windows that they can open. And that meant that Stauffenberg had to get right next to Hitler if he wanted to kill him with this bomb. The bomb is in a briefcase. Stauffenberg takes it into the room and puts it next to Hitler where he's standing at this giant oak table where he's making his plans for the war. And then Stauffenberg had someone a plan to call him to remove him from the meeting room so he wasn't there when the bomb goes off. So he leaves from the room, but as he does, Hitler moves away from the bomb and is on the other side of this oak table. So when the bomb blows up, it blows up the table, it blows out the windows, it injures many of the men, but didn't actually kill Hitler. It just knocked him unconscious briefly. And the, uh, the assassination they assumed was a success. So Klaus von Staffe and the, and the team start their coup d'etat and it fails because Hitler is alive and therefore retakes power. He then has every one of the people that's associated with this thing, including their families, shot and killed by the Gestapo or forced to take cyanide capsules, suicide pills. And one of those men, of course, is Erwin Rommel, who again was not 
really uh, associated with this thing at all in any of the planning, but will be forced to commit suicide because of his rumored participation in it. So what this all means for us in the war effort is we'll get back to the end of this story later as we see the Americans slowly but surely making it through Europe. But what this means is, again, Hitler is just convinced that he's meant to fight this thing to the very end. And we'll see the end of that war in the videos to come. Thanks for watching.